In a New York minute, everything can change. An uncelebrated understudy can be called to the spotlight and become the star of the show. And in 1990, that's exactly what happened to the New York Giants. Not once, but twice. With injuries threatening to ruin the season, two forgotten backups assumed center stage and led one of the most improbable runs in NFL history. The Giants' Super Bowl 25 victory in Tampa was an event no one saw coming except for Otis Anderson, 15 years earlier, while at the University of Miami. I said, you know, if I ever played in the Super Bowl and was in the state of Florida, I'd be the most valuable player. Now, I made that statement not knowing that I was going to get drafted by the Cardinals. In 1979, O.J. Anderson was the Cardinals' first round pick. Reminding many of another O.J. who wore number 32, he broke the record for the most rushing yards in a rookie season. Despite his winning Rookie of the Year honors, the team finished in last place. In Anderson's eighth season, not much had changed. He was still their top running back, and the Cardinals started 0-4. In week five, they faced the Giants and Anderson's college teammate, Jim Burt. During the game, Burt would always say things to me, like, you know, uh, I bet you wish you was on this team. You won't have to take all this punishment. And after the game, he comes up to me and he asked the question, what would you think if I could get you? He said he, if I could get you to be a giant. And I looked at Bert and I smiled. I said, Bert, I appreciate the offer, but there's no way that the Cardinal would trade me to the giant. I'm the franchise. No way you trade your franchise player. After the Cardinals lost to drop to 0-5, Anderson was excused from practice to answer a phone call in the training room. I said, hello, and his voice said, hey, kid. I said, hello? He said, hey, kid. I said, how you doing? He said, fine. I said, who is this? He said, it's Coach Parcells. Do you want to trade? <laughs> yeah. I see a good joke, and I hung up the phone. Click, like, yeah, right. And then I turn around looking at the trainers and going, like, you guys are good. I mean, this is one of the best practical jokes you guys have done all year. This takes the cake. Anderson would learn the phone call and the trade were real. The Cardinals now believed he had become a locker room cancer with declining skills. They sent him to the Giants for two undisclosed draft picks. Did you guys feel like he was already reached his peak and was on the downhill side? Oh, I don't think there's any question. We got him for insurance purposes. That's what he was told. This guy's got a few pelts on his horse, you know. Anderson went from OJ, number 32, the Cardinals franchise back, to Otis, number 24, the Giants disenfranchised backup. We had to sort of break him in because he had sort of a rough edge to him when he first came. I remember on an airplane ride, we were throwing pillows, hitting him while he was trying to sleep. You know, Otis was this stern guy and, you know, who threw the pillow at me? Who threw it? You coward, stand up, coward. And so uh, he went back to sleep and everybody on the plane started throwing pillows at him. And then he, he woke up again and just started laughing. And I think that broke the ice and he became one of the guys. Carl Banks was one of the team captains during the Giants' 1990 championship season. When he was a rookie in 1984, he too had a tough time endearing himself to his teammates. His first step was to introduce himself to future Hall of Fame linebackers Harry Carson and Lawrence Taylor. I'm like, hi, Mr. Carson. Hi, Mr. Taylor. I'm Carl Banks. And uh, Harry Carson looks at me and says, so what are you going to do to get on the football field? And Lawrence says, yeah, homeboy, what are you going to do to get on the field? We're pretty good at linebacker here. Two rounds after selecting Banks with the third overall pick in the 1984 draft, the Giants took Jeff Hostetler. At his first practice, Coach Bill Parcells arranged for Hostetler to get a special greeting from the team's most intimidating player. Parcells decided that, hey, the quarterback's live. And I can remember Lawrence looking at Parcells and saying, we just tap him or what? And Parcells, no, it's live. It's live, you hit him. Took a five-step drop and uh, didn't hit my fifth step when LT just drove me uh, in the back, 
face down in the mud, my helmet turned sideways. I remember seeing Parcells have to turn to try to hide him chuckling and laughing, and I thought, oh, well, hey, welcome to the NFL. Otis Anderson and Jeff Hostetler were on the Giants' 1986 championship team, but hardly played. Hostetler was in his third year as the team's third-string quarterback. He was so desperate to get on the field, he volunteered to play other positions. Two months before Super Bowl XXI, he broke his leg while playing receiver. Ended up healing, ended up practicing, ended up going to the Super Bowl. They were telling me we had a wide receiver that had missed some meetings. They were going to deactivate him and activate me. I worked my butt off. Uh, I wanted to be on that field. I wanted to be part of it. And was told uh, Friday uh, um, afterwards that I wasn't going to be activated. I was going to be IR and that we were going to sit in the stands. I remember calling George Young up and saying, hey, how can you do this? How can you have guys that are busting their butt all year long? And during the Super Bowl, biggest game of the year, you're going to set us up in the stands like we're not even part of the team? Otis Anderson was active for the game, but felt like an outsider as the team stars got all the attention. I was kind of jealous, uh, I'm going to say that, and I meant it, meant it that way, because I knew I'd done a lot in the NFL, and, and here's my opportunity to be in the Super Bowl, and really don't have a role. In the final minutes of the Giants' Super Bowl 21 victory, Bill Parcells approached the 30-year-old running back. He said, you know, kid, in case you never get to here again, here's a chance for you to try to score. I want you to go in there, replace Joe Morris. The play going to be a uh, play up the middle with Morris Lady, and here's your chance. And congratulations, and thank you for being great to us in the organization. This is what he tells me before I go on the field. All of this. Sam, there goes Otis Anderson. He's got a touchdown. There's Parcells' payback to OJ for being patient. I jumped up, and I went to spike the ball for excitement and kept the ball kind of jogged off the field. I come on the sideline, everybody's giving me high five. It was like they were sending me off more than anything else. It was a goodbye more than anything else, and that's kind of how they thought it would end up. Otis Anderson returned in 1987, but carried the ball only two times. His past accomplishments were now a distant memory to his giant teammates. Mark Ingram kept me on the show. It was his first year. He said, Otis, I said, what's up, Ingy? Because that's what we call him. He said, you know what, man? St. Louis Cardinal had a great running back. He said, man, he won number 32. That guy, O.G. Anderson, he was my idol. I said, you're kidding. He said, man, when I was growing up in my backyard, I was O.G. Anderson, man. I just, I just loved him. You know what? Whatever happened to him? And I looked at Mark and I said, Ingy. I said, you ain't going to believe it, but you're talking to him. He said, yeah, you Otis Anderson. You ain't O.J. Anderson. I said, no, Ingy, really. I'm the same guy. The season prior to 1990, starting running back Joe Morris broke his foot, and Parcells gave Anderson another chance to make a name for himself. I'm going to go with the regular people. All right, you want O.J. or Tilton? Who's your back? Who's your Let's go with O.J. All right, O.J. I said, you know what? I'm going to shock the world. In 1989, O.J. was back in name and in deed. Anderson gained over 1,000 yards, scored 14 touchdowns, and led the Giants to the NFC East title. I could have scored on that Sunday. <laughs> hey, from there to that show's feet, I, I got smart. Made 20. I got smart. I could have made 20 myself. We have a good relationship. Otis is not ready to go to the rocking chair yet. I tell you, he's been a joy to coach here. He does exactly what he's asked to do. He's always ready. That's what, that's what I need to feel right there. You got it. I'm going to go and get stuff. I certainly have a lot of confidence in him, and I think that's quite obvious to, to everyone connected with Giant football that I do. All the good feelings from Anderson's resurgence were wiped away in the Giants' first playoff game. Touchdown! And the game is over! And the Giants do not are out of the playoff. Going to the locker room, looking at my career, going, it's over. I mean, whatever I said I was going to do, it, it's gone. Tired, sore, legs sore. I mean, hey. Feeling your age, OJ? I'm no young pup. 
Anderson told teammate Maurice Carthon the loss ended his dream of winning a Super Bowl MVP award in Anderson's home state of Florida. And Maurice looked at me and he said, your dream may not be totally over. I said, why you say that? He said, you know where the next Super Bowl is? I said, no. Where? He said, it's in Tampa. I said, wait a minute, Tampa, Florida? He said, yes. I said, Maurice, as I sit on this stool, we're going to play in that Super Bowl, and my dream is going to come true. In the first round of the 1990 draft, the Giants selected running back Rodney Hampton. Rodney Hampton, first round draft pick, I know what that means. As a player who, who went to St. Louis as a first round draft pick, you're going to play. In the season opener against the Eagles, Hampton scored the team's first touchdown. The Giants won the game and established their formula for success a mistake-free offense, and a dominant defense that would allow the fewest points in the league. One of our big sayings that year was to make our opponent quit. In some cases, it took about a quarter. In other cases, it would take three quarters, but we could come off to a man, and you'd hear guys say, my guy just quit. We got him. The man Bill Parcells entrusted to run the defense was coordinator Bill Belichick. You with me, Carl? Yeah. I know he was looking uh, on this Bill, side. Here, before you start telling about plays, you better you better tell him that we alert for the hurry up. Man. We got it, Bill. We've already okay. been over. Belichick was allowed to be autonomous in the way he ran the defense, but yet uh, Bill Parcells had to put a check mark next to every game plan. No, I'm just Bill, saying, don't leave it like that. I'll alert you to the fact that he might yeah. not be coming out. If Bill wanted to see something. And Belichick overruled him. Parcells would tell him to his face in front of everyone. Quit broadcasting the game and call the defense. If it doesn't work, you're fired. Parcells may have threatened his coaches, but his strongest motivational tactics were saved for his players. Tell that undisciplined center we got to get his head out of his ass. Parcells used to tell us all the time, you're not that good. They're ready to quit yeah. we just run for two first downs and we keep giving them a holding penalty now get in the game man you mediocre team you've been mediocre all year you're probably going to be mediocre at the end of the year and you need to understand that that is sort of the relationship bill had with his players he would do something or say something crazy to you it affected players differently i went through a long period where parcells and i we literally hated each other for about an hour a day. I know some players to this day that just don't like Bill Parcells, but they played hard for him. When Carl Banks dislocated his wrist prior to week six, Parcells challenged him without having to say much at all. I was certain I couldn't play. Bill asked me, he says, do you think you can play? He would never pressure you. He would look you in the eye. If you told him you could go, he expected your 100% best. If you couldn't, he wouldn't be upset with you, but the unspoken peer pressure put an added pressure on a guy who was a competitor. And I knew from the minute I finished that conversation with Bill that I was going to go out and play. And I knew that if I could will the pain away, I would perform well. Spurred by Banks' heroics, the Giants won to climb to 5-0. and But for Banks, the win came at a cost. Playing the game with one good arm, he broke his dislocated wrist. Doctors told him he'd be out at least two months, possibly the rest of the season. I said, okay, I'm making it back because, quite honestly, they had brought in Johnny Cooks, guy that could play my position. Johnny was good, and I liked to watch Johnny play, but I didn't want Johnny to be playing uh, in my position. The Giants' defense without Banks continued to tear apart opposing offenses. Bill Sims became the league's top-rated passer. The Giants continued their torrid start and ran their record to 10-0. The team looked invincible, but Parcells was not convinced. First of all, we're not back on top. We've just, we're currently leading our division. 
which is a very tenuous position. Parcell's skepticism seemed justified the next week. The Giants were soundly beaten by the Eagles to drop the 10 and 1. Banks returned for the showdown the following week with the 10 and 1 two time defending champion, San Francisco 49ers. Down by four in the final minutes, the Giants had first and goal from the nine. The 49ers made a stand and now had bragging rights over the Giants for the NFL's best record. Ronnie Lott was in Phil's face at the end of the game, taunting him, and we don't forget those type of things. So it wasn't one of those deals where their players teased us, we went in the locker room and cried because we weren't good enough. It just motivated us, and we wanted to see them again. Heading into week 15, the Giants had lost two out of their last three games. Their next opponent was the Buffalo Bills, the team they would meet in the Super Bowl. Their season was at its critical point. Jeff Hostetler was at his breaking point. To comprehend why, it is necessary to understand all that he had endured throughout his professional career. His troubles began off the field in 1985, following the birth of his first son, Jason. Everything looked great and uh, we were celebrating and I ended up going home probably one, two o'clock in the morning and uh, I remember the following morning getting a frantic f phone call from my wife. The doctors telling me that they didn't know whether he was going to make it. Jason was admitted for open heart surgery, his first of four in the next 11 months. While his son battled for his life, Jeff fought for his pro football livelihood. His first chance to play quarterback in a game did not come until 1988, his fifth season. He got his first start against the Saints, ahead of veteran Jeff Rutledge. But at the start of the second half, Parcells made a change. I'm at the end of the tunnel, and Parcells comes up past me and nudges me and says, I'm going to start Rutledge the second half. It has nothing to do with you, I just have a gut feeling. Well, th that gut feeling right there had ended it for me. Bill, are you concerned about the effect of pulling Jeff Hostetler out of the game at the end of the first half against New Orleans? If his sensitivity level is too great and he can't cope with a little adversity and a little uh, uh, criticisms, then uh, yeah, it might have an effect. I'm certainly not worried about the player's ego. And those are the decisions I make. And, um, you know, if uh, he's unhappy with the Giants, uh, and, uh, you know, doesn't feel like he has a future here, well, fine, he can go somewhere else. I don't want guys that want to beat Giants. In my eyes, severed everything. I was done. Uh, I couldn't play for him. Hostetler requested a trade but was denied. Feeling dejected, he found inspiration from his now healthy three-year-old son, Jason. After all the things he'd gone through, it hit me that, you know what, if he can make it, if he can continue to struggle, continue to fight, then I'm going to continue to fight. Parcell's handling of Hostetler took an unusual turn in week four of the Giants' 1990 Super Bowl season. Where's Haas? Hostetler! Jeff! Where's Hostetler? With the game still in doubt and Phil Simms playing well, Parcell's pulled him for Hostetler. Run to the 10, he might score! I think he was testing me. I think he was testing my preparation. He was testing me whether I was ready to go at a moment's notice. The man's kind of like a genius, how you can just figure out scenarios before they happen. Three weeks later, with the Giants halfway to their 10-0 start, Sims was injured against the Cardinals. Hostetler entered the game and down 19-10 with six minutes left, sparked an improbable comeback. Rose everything, way down. To come from behind by nine points with less than six minutes to go was huge. I think I proved a lot to not only the coaching staff and Parcells, but I think I proved a lot to, you know, my fellow teammates. Hostetler's moment in the sun was eclipsed the very next week. A healthy Sims was back as the starter, 
and Hostetler returned to not playing at all. For the Giants' backup quarterback of nearly seven seasons, it was more of the same and more than he could take. Seven, eight weeks go by and I, I've just had it. I mean, uh, you know, you think about it, six and a half years, how long six and a half years is? You know, over 2,000 days. I remember coming home after Friday practice, no reps again, sat down at the dinner table with my wife. I can remember telling her, that's it, I'm done. I'm absolutely done, I've had it. End of the year, we're moving, taking everything, I'm done with football, I'm retiring, um, I've had it. And I, I felt, I felt like I'd finally reached the end. I, I felt like I'd reached the bottom. Uh, there wasn't any more, uh, uh, any further that I could go. And um, uh, I felt disappointed. I felt empty. Um, but I couldn't handle it anymore. When you know Sunday comes along and it's raining, I'm soaked. I'm probably the coldest that I've been the whole season. We're playing the Bills. And all of a sudden, Phil goes down. And I'm thinking, get up, Sims. Don't give me none of that. You come out now, I'll kill you. I felt like it was going to be the same old thing. I'd have to go in for a little bit, and then he'll be back. Didn't realize what the extent of Phil's injury was, and didn't realize that right in front of me was the opportunity that I've been waiting for. This time, Hostetler could not complete the comeback. The team lost for the third time in four games. Sims was finished for the year with a severely sprained foot, and many believed the Giants were too. For most of the 1990 season, Otis Anderson split time at running back with number 27 rookie Rodney Hampton. By the end of the season, Hampton was the clear-cut starter. Anderson, despite gaining 784 yards and scoring 11 touchdowns, was primarily a short yardage back. Jeff Hostetler was now the starting quarterback. With Hostetler in command, the Giants finished the regular season with a pair of unimpressive three-point wins against two of the worst teams in the league. Are you concerned in any way about the way the Giants ended up the season, the way they played? I am somewhat concerned because they were not playing with a whole lot of emotion. You cannot just switch it on and switch it off, contrary to what a whole lot of people think. They wrote us off. I think the media just felt that we just weren't good enough and we were just a, a team waiting to lose. Nobody on the bandwagon. Everybody was a pessimist. Everybody was a naysayer. Everybody was a... Look what you got at quarterback. Here's your weak link. He's never going to be able to do it. You know, everybody's trying to stir that up around here. You know, who's sitting, who's playing. I don't really give a I've got to tell you the truth. It's, it's unbelievable. You know, that's why sometimes I call you guys commies. That's why. It's that stuff right there. There it is. Sub subversive from within. A lot of people outside of our locker room didn't realize everybody rooted for Jeff Hosteller. He stood in special teams huddles. He ran scout team in practice. The guy did everything, so he was every man's man. The Giants may have believed they could win with Hosteller, but entering their first playoff game, not every player had the look of a champion. I made the mistake of putting on my practice pants because they looked like my game pants. Had my ankles taped, had my shoes taped on. So for me to get totally undressed to start all over, I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep on my practice pants. And the chances are I'm not going to play anyway. While Anderson believed his time had passed, Hostetler made certain he savored every moment from the biggest game of his life to date. I can remember the first, the first offensive snap. Everything stopping, everything was silent. And looking and seeing Mike Singletary right over top of me and saying, man, those eyes are that big. Hostetler stared down the Bears' vaunted defense and threw two first-half touchdowns. But all was not well with the Giants' offense. Rodney Hampton had injured his leg. I'm on the sideline, in my practice pants, saying to myself, there's no way in the world I'm a plate. And then they tell Bill. They said, Bill, Rodney's out. He said, well, give me OJ. 
playing in his practice pants, Anderson carried the ball 21 times, gained 80 yards, and paved the way for Hostetler's third touchdown by blocking William the Refrigerator Perry. a statement that we're back. Got one more? One more. Nobody thinks we can win yet. I know. Matter of fact, they didn't give us a chance in this one. After the convincing victory, Parcells approached Hostetler and offered some words of encouragement. They weren't great comments, but uh, Parcells didn't give a whole lot of great comments. But I can remember he made a comment, if we didn't win it, it wasn't because of the quarterback, which to me, that was a pat in the back, and he doesn't give a whole lot of pat in the backs. Parcells told Anderson he had regained the starting running back job under one condition. He must continue to wear his practice pants during games. And I remember Parcells telling me, I'm going to pay the fine, and because we won, you wear it again next week. In the NFC Championship game, the Giants returned to San Francisco for a rematch with the two-time defending champion 49ers. They were the team. They were going for their three-peat. They were flashy. They seemed to be the media's choice. And the uh, Giants were a mere formality. We were coming in to get beat and sent home. Before the game, Parcells told the players their travel options. With no week off before the Super Bowl, the winner of the championship game instead of heading home, would fly directly to Tampa. Parcells had indicated to us that you can pack for two days or you can pack for the whole week. And I remember Parcells throwing down a suitcase, and it was a big suitcase. He said, I guess you know which one I'm packing for. The Giants and 49ers staged one of the most physical games ever played. fourth quarter, with the 49ers leading 13 to 9, former giant Jim Burt landed what appeared to be the decisive blow. My leg snaps back and twists and I can hear it pop and I've got a burning sensation and I'm down and I'm feeling like it's over. Hosteller is down. Boy, He's hurt. Really gave him a shot. He's hurt. Trainers come out and I, I can't even talk to them. I can remember finally settling down a little bit and answering some of their questions and then feeling a little tingling from my head down and just saying, yeah, I can do this. He's up on his feet and walking off the field. Unbelievable after that hit. Hostetler recovered while the rest of the Giants prepared to rally around him and strike back. I knew the guys around me, you know, my offensive linemen of the offense, I knew they'd do anything for me. Um, what I didn't realize is how that defensive unit responded to that. It was eating them up. We were angry. It probably wasn't a dirty play, but because it was Jim Burt and he was one of our guys, we were upset. It was unspoken that if you hurt one of our guys, we knew the guy to go after. If you watch that, that particular play, Leonard Marshall's blocked. He's down on the ground. He's down on the ground and never stops. He hit Joe and we thought he killed him. Steve Young came in for the 49ers' final drive and needed only two first downs to run out the clock. I remember Mark Ingram saying, 
here's my chance to go to Tampa, my chance to play in the Super Bowl, and, and now it's going down the drain. And I said, Inky, it's my destiny. We're going to go to the Super Bowl. He said, come on, Juice. He said, they got the ball. They're running out the clock. I said, I'm telling you, Inky, it's my destiny. It's, it's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Offensively, we've got very little time, but we have enough time, and we know we can do it. Hoffman was trying to pass, runs away from trouble, turns upfield, runs to the sideline, and throws on the run, and completes the ball. Yeah! Jeff Hostetler passed the Giants into field goal range and a step closer to their date with Otis Anderson's destiny. The ball depends on Matt Barr. Oh my goodness. If the field goal is good, they win. And I can actually still see the laces coming back. I knew if I got it down, it was good. Instead of heading back to Dort, heading southeast. Get him right! They said good I love you, baby. I love you. <laughs> to be able to go in uh, to Candlestick Park um, to end the three-peat for the 49ers, uh, to do something that everybody said no way in the world's going to happen. Um, phenomenal feeling. They keep on telling me I can't, and you know I'm going to the Super Bowl. So uh, the quarterback who could not get on the field was now New York's most sought-after star. Broadcaster John Madden wanted to interview him next, and Bill Parcells was was coming up past me. As soon as he got to the buses, the buses were taken off. So I told the guys that were with me, hey, I only do this interview if you hold the buses. And they said, don't worry about it. He's not going to leave. Nobody's going to leave. So I do the interview with Madden. I come up, and I think there were four or five buses, all of them gone. Madden came up and, and said, what's wrong? And I, <laughs> I told him that uh, Bill took off. And uh, he just started laughing. He said, I'll get you there. Well, I thought, how in the world are you going to get me there? I have no idea even where the plane is. We got on his Madden Cruiser, and his driver made a couple calls, pulled to the, uh, the airport, and we pulled this back gate, and somehow the back gate opens up. I can remember walking up um, uh, onto the plane, and Bill was sitting there right away in the first row. And I can remember the look in his face, where he was as surprised as could be that I was there. And just the nod of approval that I'd found the way to get there was all I needed. It was the perfect metaphor for the Giants' season. The team everyone dismissed, with the quarterback everyone overlooked, had found its way to the Super Bowl. Prior to Super Bowl 25, the United States had entered the Persian Gulf War. The event altered some of the usual Super Bowl customs. Disney had had interviewed all of the guys that they thought were potential MVPs the day before. And it had all asked all of us that if we were selected MVP, we had two things that we could say. One was, I'm going to Disney, which is trip, you know, traditional. Or we can say, I dedicate this game to our troops. And the air base here in eastern Saudi Arabia is again under attack. We must have While Otis Anderson watched the war from his hotel room, the Giants coaches studied the heavily favored Buffalo Bills. They decided their best chance for an upset was to feature their 34-year-old running back. Parcells said, we're just going to pound them to death. And we want to know what plays you're comfortable with because we're going to run those 15 to 30 times a game until we wear him down. He said, how do you feel about that? I said, Bill, I'm ready to play. Whatever you do is fine by me, and uh, I look forward to the challenge. Bill. Big night. Bill Belichick's challenge was to slow down the Bills' offense. 
in their two playoff games, Buffalo had scored 44 and 51 points. He said, you guys are going to have to trust me. In order for us to win this football game, Thurman Thomas is going to have to gain 100 yards rushing. And, you know, guys are grumbling because it's like pride. It's like, are you out of your mind? We're not letting this guy get 100 yards. And then he brings it back to reality for us. Belichick explained that he planned to employ a defense designed to punish the Bills receivers and prevent yards after the catch at the expense of stopping the run. And then he just kind of paused and said, are you guys with me on this game plan? Okay, we're with you. First of all, Super Bowl, without a doubt, the ultimate as far as emotions. Nothing prepares you, the feelings that you have standing in that tunnel waiting to be introduced. Running out and seeing everybody holding the little American flags. I still get chills thinking about that time. And so um, you go from that to boom, ready to go. Carl Banks put Belichick's plan into action. And the rest of the unit followed. The Bills defense countered by attacking Hostetler. Cracked open the, the ammonia capsules and put it right underneath my nose, and I didn't react. And they told me to breathe deep and didn't react. For some reason, I can remember the face on, on the doctors looking and rolling their eyes, thinking, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Hostetler staggered back, but with Buffalo ahead by seven and the Giants pinned deep, the Bills' Bruce Smith nearly delivered the knockout. As I'm dropping back, Otis comes in a little too tight, trips me up, and then all of a sudden, I felt this big old mitt on my wrist. I didn't lose the ball, was able to bring it back into my body. You know, they came up with a safety, but they could easily had seven, which might have put an end to the game. With less than four minutes left in the half, the Giants regained possession at their own 13. We needed to score. Our defense had been doing a real good job. We had to do our part. Two former backups, Hostetler and Anderson, then led two of the most impressive drives in Super Bowl history. Mark Ingram on a crossing route and just watch him. He's got Ingram for maybe a first down. He'll try to his money. Yes, he's got it. What effort. You know, everybody saw it. Everybody felt it. Um, you know, we just knew. After an 87-yard drive to end the first half and a nine-and-a-half-minute possession to begin the second, the Giants were ahead. But as the game went on, uh, Marv Levy and his staff realized that Thurman Thomas could run the football, and we were conceding the run. Running play, Thurman Thomas breaks it at the 25, still on his feet at the 20, gets down to the 15, the 10, the 5, and scores! 31-yard touchdown run! With just over two minutes left, the Bills trailed by one and began driving for the game-winning field goal. Our defense at that point was bend but don't break because we couldn't change it. I can remember just watching once they crossed the uh, 50, thinking, that's trouble. I'm on the sideline saying, please, Lord, stop them. This is my destiny. You know, I predicted it. Here's my chance. Don't let this be taken away from me. With eight seconds left, the Bills had reached the New York 30. The fate of the Giants now came down to a 47-yard field goal attempt by Bill's kicker, 
Scott Norwood. A guy from Disney was standing behind me saying, if you miss this kick, you're the most valuable player. And I'm like, what? He's like, if you miss this kick, I, I, I want to hear that. You know, I just kind of shook him up. I don't want to hear that. I want to see if he's going to make this kick. And then on the other side of the field, they were telling Thurman Thomas, if you make this kick, you're the most valuable player. I went to the one end of the sideline, kneeled down, just told myself I gave everything I could. I'm going to watch. I'm just going to watch everybody no matter what. Scott Norwood. He can fire the shot heard round the world now and win a Super Bowl. I can see the snap. I can hear the kick. He hit it good. And I remember just slow motion and just watching the ball and not being able to tell whether it was good or not. From my angle I had, it looked good. It wasn't that big of a miss. It was maybe about a yard or two. And I couldn't see anything but the body language of the guys that were on the field. When our guys started jumping up, it was just, oh. went over to hug the coach, and he asked for a ride. The Giants coaching staff had masterminded the perfect upset. Belichick's defensive game plan now resides in the Hall of Fame. The offense set a Super Bowl record for time of possession. And Anderson gained a season-high 102 yards and achieved his destiny. I lost it. I jumped. I went running. I went yelling on the field. We did it. We did it. We did it. And the guy from Disney running behind me saying, you're the MVP. You're the MVP. You're the MVP of the game. And the guy's chasing me, and I'm going like, leave me alone. You know, we won. We won. We won. I'm dedicating this win to our troops. And everybody shouting my name, OJ MVP, OJ MVP. And I just kind of dropped heels at that point in time because I just couldn't believe that, that my dream of 12 years had finally come true. And it was in Tampa, and it was what I had predicted. I think when it really hit me was standing up on the podium uh, with my two boys and my wife who was pregnant with our third and realizing that uh, six weeks earlier um, I was sitting at a table telling my wife that was it. You know, that kind of hit. They said it can't be done, it won't be done. It was done. Um, something that they said would never happen, couldn't happen. Uh, here we are. Uh, we've won the Super Bowl. For additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game.